Hello. Thank you for making the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. It was seven years ago when Tristan and I received the offer to come work here with the Greenbrier Church family. We were excited about the opportunity to come to East Alabama and to help cast a vision for what God could accomplish in this community and through this church family. It wasn't a decision that we made lightly. We, we spent some time in thought and prayer and conversation because, well, like everybody else, we longed to be a part of a family that welcomed us, that loved us, that did a whole lot more than just merely tolerated us. Over the last seven years, a lot has happened in our life and in the life of this church family. We've celebrated births. We've celebrated weddings. We've mourned together in times of loss. We endured a global epidemic. We canceled our services for a while. We had people that we deeply loved make the decision that they wanted to be a part of another church family or to be somewhere else. We welcomed new members to this family. We rejoiced in the opportunity that we had to love people that were struggling and hurting. I turned 50. This church family walked with Trista and I when we almost lost my mom a couple years ago in a car wreck and then walked with us again a year later when we almost lost her dad in a car wreck. This church family celebrated my boys' achievements, their graduations, when they decided to move to Nashville. We're still very grateful and thankful that we were invited to come and be a part of this church family, and we're even more grateful that we accepted that offer. As we're getting close to that seven-year mark, I wanted to take some time to tell this church family how thankful I am that we were on this journey together. I wanted to, to write something to them that would not only show my appreciation, but would also cast a vision for what I believe God wants to do next. And yet the more I thought about it, the more I began to realize that what I wanted to write and to tell this church is very much what Paul wrote in the book of Philippians. It's Paul's love letter to his friends. We're called to be a place where people feel loved and accepted in the middle of a community and a culture where we tolerate one another at best. We don't really enjoy the people that live around us or the people that we work with or sometimes even the person that we're married to. Most of our relationships are more a matter of endurance than enjoyment. We don't really enjoy the people in our lives. We tolerate them at best. We put up with them. Our culture is losing the ability to have real community, a place where we can be known and accepted, where people can see that we're not that perfect facade that we try to portray, but yet they love us anyway. They know about our faults and our failures, and they love us. Our need for acceptance is a driving force behind the despair, anxiety, and discouragement that is plaguing our world. Our country has never seen so many people on antidepressants. Our culture has never seen so many people struggling with whether or not this life is worth living. We live in a world that has moved far away from God. It's a world that's still trying to find peace and meaning, but they're trying to find it in all the wrong places. When Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi, he shares an antidote to their despair. He says, I know what the problem is, so let me remind you that to live is Christ. Let me remind you who you are. Paul's writing to his friends who have come to understand the hope that we have in this world. Paul reminds them consistently to remember their joy. And over the next couple of weeks, I want us to take some time to look at this letter, the letter that I wish that I could have written to this church, because I want to remind you that God loves us, even when things aren't working out the way that we want them to. Look with me at how Paul begins the letter. He says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day 
when Christ Jesus returns. I love the fact that Paul starts this beautiful letter by finding reasons to be grateful. In verse 3, he says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Paul's made the decision that he's going to focus on the good things about people, focus on the good times that they had. But if you know the backstory, you know that Paul didn't really have a good time in Philippi. Actually, there was very little good about that visit at all. In Acts chapter 16, we discover that Paul goes to Philippi where he is arrested, beaten, humiliated, thrown into prison, endures an earthquake, and after enduring all of that, putting up with all of that headache and heartache and pain, he says, when I think of you, I remember the good things. Paul could have dwelt on the negative. He could have remembered the painful memories, but instead he said, I'm going to focus on the things that I'm grateful for. I know that there's somebody in your past that hurt you, and maybe you're still holding on to that hurt. Maybe you're having difficulty forgiving them and moving forward with your life. Maybe there's a lack of joy in your life because you're constantly focusing on the negative, on the bad. Paul shows us how powerful it is to be grateful for the good in people, to think back and to make the choice to remember what is good. You know, we have the ability to choose how we're going to react. We have the ability to choose what we focus on. I can choose what I'm going to remember about the past. And and I'm not saying that you need to deny the hurt in your life or that you just excuse the weakness in other people. That's really not healthy. But the fact remains that you get to choose what you're going to dwell on, what you're going to focus on. There are people who go on a seven-day cruise and all they do is come back and complain because there were too many waves. And there are also people that are called to an eight-hour meeting at the IRS and they leave that meeting talking about how great the coffee was in the break room. In both situations, they made the choice of what they were going to focus on. You can focus on the good, you can choose to emphasize the strengths of others, or you can over-focus on the shortcomings of others. But whatever you choose, that's going to bring you either joy or misery. We need to be grateful in the good in other people and remember that that every one of us are just merely rough drafts of what we're going to eventually become. Paul could have dwelled, he could have over-focused on the mistreatment that he endured. He could have become anxious when he remembered how they humiliated him and beat him and threw him into prison. But instead, he chose to remember the loyalty of the people. In verse 5, he says, You've been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. I wonder this morning, who's been loyal to you? Maybe it's somebody that you work with. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's your husband or your wife. You might not be able to put your finger on something big or something spectacular that they did in your life, but it seems like every time you turn around, they're there. They had every opportunity to walk out, to move on, but they made the choice to stay. They hung in there. When you were going through bankruptcy, they were there. When there was a crisis at work, they were there. A loss in your family, a change in your career. When you were just being a jerk, they stayed there. You ought to appreciate that. You gave them every opportunity to walk away from you. You might have even tried to push them away from you, but they made the decision to stay. Those are the people that you need to celebrate in your life. If you want to enjoy others, focus on their strengths, not their weaknesses. One of the things that I've learned from this letter that Paul wrote is that the quickest way that I can change any relationship that I'm in from bad to good is to start thanking God and praying about them. In verse 4, Paul writes, Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. Paul understood that love leads to prayer. When you make the choice to love someone, to act in loving ways towards them, you long to take their name before the throne of God. 
I realize that a lot of us don't really know how to pray for one another. I mean, we're pretty good at praying about crises, but we kind of get lost praying for one another every day because we never really get below the surface. In verses 9 through 11, Paul says, this is how I pray for you every day. He says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. If you want to pray for me and for my family, these are the things that I wish you'd pray for us. There's three of them. First, I wish that you would pray that we will grow in love and in wisdom, that we will do the right thing, and that we will live for the glory of God. We don't usually think of love being so closely tied with wisdom because love is an emotion and wisdom is intellect. Love has to do with affection, not with knowledge, not with wisdom. Yet for Paul, they're connected. We often make this distinction between head knowledge and heart feelings, and that's not necessarily the case. If our Christian love is to be genuine, that only happens when we come to a knowledge of who God truly is and a knowledge of who we truly are. Until we come to a better knowledge, I don't think we can ever really know how to love. Secondly, I want you to pray that we understand what really matters. Pray that we have the ability to discern what's right and what's wrong and not merely just go along with the culture. We live in a world where moral issues are often blurred and distorted. It can be difficult at times to know what's the loving and morally right thing to do. Paul prays that the Philippians mature in their ability to recognize what's from God and what's from the world. You see, our world so often wants to operate in shades of gray. But when we understand that we're called by God to love our neighbor and to point them to Him, if we can understand what it means to love God and to love the people that He loves, I think that's when we can focus on living a pure and blameless life. Finally, I I would like for you to pray that we live a life that will make Jesus proud. That, That our decisions and our actions will allow us to walk like Jesus walked pray that we will live for God's glory and not our own. If we're filled with the fruits of righteousness, we'll be able to bring glory to God, and that'll be seen in the way that we treat one another. It'll affect our desire to show mercy to be people of grace. Living for God's glory means that I'm not responsible to hold anybody accountable. I'm just responsible to hold them close, to point them to Jesus. Living for God's glory allows me to recognize that God is still at work in your life. In verse 6, Paul says, I'm certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I think that's a great verse to underline in your Bible. Because Paul says, God's at work and he's going to finish what he started. Truthfully, I'm not always a great finisher. I mean, I start pretty well, but over time, my excitement and my drive diminishes. And it's not just my problem, it's a universal problem. That's why we have unfinished symphonies, unfinished buildings, unfinished books, unfinished projects. I know that oftentimes I've made a huge mess of so many things. I mean, we all have this laundry list of failures and mistakes, and We don't always finish what we start, but Paul says you don't have to worry with that. God will always bring his will to completion. In spite of our hang-ups, our faults, our bad decisions, our selfish actions, our outright rebellion, our sin, in spite of all the circumstances that we face, Paul says you can trust that God is going to finish what he started in our lives. 
We have the promise that on the day of judgment, we're going to stand before God covered by the blood of Jesus because God is going to finish what he started, which means he's not done yet. Just like I'm not a finished work, neither are you, and neither is anybody that we come in contact with. That's why we need to be patient with people and allow them to make progress. We need to find joy in their growth and in their development. In your marriage, if you want to really enjoy your marriage, you've got to learn how to enjoy your husband or to enjoy your wife right now while allowing for them to grow and to mature and to develop. I hope that I'm a better husband right now than I was 10 years ago. And there's not a doubt in my mind that Trista is a better wife right now than she was 10 years ago because we both continue to grow and to mature. And there's joy in being able to enjoy each other while we grow and mature. If a parent is going to learn to enjoy their kids, they've got to learn to enjoy them in the process while they're growing. There's no such thing as a perfect kid, and there's no such thing as a perfect adult. This is the first time that you as a parent have ever had a child with these characteristics at this age, and this is the first time that that child has ever been this age, had to deal with all of those emotions, struggles, talents, confusions. And if we demand perfection of one another, if we say you have to be perfect before I can enjoy you, then we're miserable because nobody's perfect. Paul was able to enjoy being with the Philippians in spite of all of their failures because he learned the secret of being joyful. Joyful in all of our relationships. Go back and see what he says in verse 8. He says, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I've discovered that if people aren't on my heart, they're on my nerves. When I allow members of this church family or members of my own family to get outside my heart, that's the moment they get on my nerves. When I forget to long for people with the tender compassion of Jesus, that's the moment that I long for them to just go far, far, far away. When I react out of what I feel or what I think I know, that's the moment that my relationships begin to crumble. Longing for one another with the tender compassion of Jesus is this way of doing life. It's a way of living and loving. It's about going to extremes and expressing the hope that God offers us. It's about living in a hope that makes us brave and expels the darkness in our world with light. That's what I want my life to be about. But I also understand that living in the tender compassion of Jesus is costly because it involves sacrifice and presence. That's what love does. It pursues blindly, unfinchingly, without end. Love does more than merely tolerate other people. Love means I'm willing to sacrifice for you. Loving and tender compassion means that I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. When that guy at work acts like a jerk... Have you ever stopped and gave them the benefit of the doubt? Have you ever considered that maybe he's had a bad day? Maybe somebody they love is sick. Maybe he's dealing with loss. People that are hurting are more likely to hurt someone else. And so what that guy needs most right now is to be welcomed and accepted and loved when the best that we want to offer them is tolerance. Or let's say you're at the grocery store and a woman pushes by you and she takes that last box of cereal. Have you ever considered that maybe she's got a child at home that's sick? Maybe she's had a long day at work and she endured people that yelled at her and demeaned her all day long. And now she's just kind of in a daze. She's walking through on autopilot and she didn't really see you standing there. Maybe she needs someone to treat her with the tender compassion of Christ. When your child throws a tantrum or shuts you out, maybe they're dealing with feelings and emotions that are too big for them to handle at the moment. They've never been this age before. They're scared or hurt or sad or lonely. 
And they're not sure what to do with all of these feelings. What they need most from you right now is the tender compassion of Christ. I'm not saying that you need to excuse their bad behavior. I'm saying that maybe you need to come alongside them and lovingly remind them that you're on their team. You see, that's the beautiful thing about coming to the table. We gather at the table as a family. Each one of us are deeply scarred. We've each made huge decisions that hurt someone else. But we're also faced with the truth that we're deeply loved by our Father. Each one of us have been saved by the same grace and the same mercy. We can fully accept one another because we understand that in God's tender compassion, He has offered a way for us to be accepted and loved and welcomed and wanted. Today, when we take the bread and we share the cup, we're taking physical reminders of God's great love for us. And we see that God has done so much more than just merely tolerate us. He sacrificed so that we could have a seat at His table and be with Him for all eternity. I really hope that you have a wonderful time around the table today. Because regardless of what happens in this world, you are deeply loved and you are wanted. You are wanted by your Creator, your Sustainer, and your Savior. I hope you have a wonderful week. Never forget how deeply you're loved. And I look forward to seeing you very soon.